This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue our coverage of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we're joined by Joshua Yaffa, a contributing writer to The New Yorker, who has been the magazine's Moscow correspondent since 2016. He just left Ukraine this weekend after reporting on the Russian invasion for the past two weeks. His latest piece is headlined, What the Russian Invasion Has Done to Ukraine. Uh, Josh Yaffa is also author of the book Between Two Fires, Truth, Ambition and Compromise in Putin's Russia. Joshua, welcome back to Democracy Now! OK, no sound bites here. Take us on your journey among the places you go to are the hospitals of Ukraine and what this invasion means for so many vulnerable people. Thanks for the invitation and happy to be with you today. I started this current reporting trip in Ukraine, where I had been many times over the years, uh, been going to Ukraine over the last decade on successive reporting trips and really come to, to love uh, the city of Kiev uh, and, and the people uh, and, and much of the country that I got to see in those years. This time, I started uh, my journey in early February. This is still several weeks before the invasion began, when it was difficult for people both in Moscow uh, and in Kiev to believe that such a thing was possible. In Kiev, people were not uh, doubtful or skeptical of the possibility of invasion because they had any illusions or doubts about the intentions of Vladimir Putin regarding uh, their country, but simply the, the thought of a wholesale uh, or large-scale land invasion uh, with Russian forces streaming into the country from uh, several sides with air raids, missile strikes, and so on just seemed an unbelievable um, prospect. Uh, and it stayed that way right up until the days before the invasion. I think the uh, seriousness and, and likelihood and even imminence uh, of the war really only sunk in in the three or four days before it began. I had myself gone uh, to Donbass in eastern Ukraine. This is an area that uh, has seen war with Russia for many years, going back to 2014, when having annexed Crimea, Russia launched a would-be uh, separatist war backing uh, rebel militias in the Donbass. Uh, leading to a war that, that really went on into the uh, current day, a war that never really uh, ended, but was limited to these eastern territories in the Donbass region of Ukraine. And many people, myself included, thought that if there were to be a new invasion, that it would probably start in the Donbass. It would emanate out of these regions that have already seen fighting between Ukrainian forces and Russian forces and Russian-backed uh, proxies. And so I was in the Donbass. Um, on the eve of, of the war, expecting that if there was to be an escalation, it would happen there. Instead, I was woken up at 5 a.m. Uh, to the thunderous sound uh, of missile strikes hitting uh, the city of Kramatorsk in the Donbass, where I was at the time. And, and when I woke up at 5 a.m. Uh, to the sound of these uh, missile strikes hitting nearby, uh, I, I opened my phone and, and looked at the news and, and saw on the one hand, that Putin uh, was delivering this early morning speech in Moscow, declaring the start of what he called a special military operation, but what in fact uh, was clearly an invasion, clearly a war, and that strikes were happening all over the country, in Kharkiv, in Kiev, even in the west uh, of the country, uh, the areas that, that uh, few thought the Russian invasion uh, would, uh, would reach. And, and from there, uh, very quickly, we understood that the scale uh, of this attack and the scale of Russia's intentions, what Putin was trying to achieve here. I think in the early days of the war, uh, as your previous guest uh, has spoken to and, and you've discussed on the show prior, uh, Putin was looking to do regime change here. He wanted to overthrow through, with military force uh, the government of uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, install a pro-Russian regime. And the way to do that, uh, first and foremost, was taking uh, the capital, taking Kiev, and, and also uh, decimating Ukrainian military infrastructure and seizing other Ukrainian cities. And once I understood uh, the true scale of this invasion and its aims, already on, on the first day, having uh, woken up to the sound of bombs in Kramatorsk, I made my way uh, to Kiev uh, with some colleagues, with a photographer, Emanuele Satole, uh, that I was working with. Uh, it took us two days uh, to reach Kiev, driving by car all the way from Donbass, with highways clogged with families trying to flee the fighting, Ukrainian military equipment, tanks and armor going in the other direction, trying to reach uh, the front. 
and eventually made um, our way to Kiev, where I spent the next uh, 10 days waiting for a siege that never quite happened. Your previous guest spoke to this, uh, to the fact that Russian forces on a number of sides have surrounded Kiev. There's heavy fighting going on to the north, uh, west, uh, some to the east, increasingly to the west. Um, the southern direction remains open. That's an, uh, a key artery. In fact, the only way in or out uh, of the capital and how I eventually left. I can talk about that in, in a few minutes. But um, Kiev was a city transformed. I had been away for only four or five days since I departed on my trip to the Donbass. On the eve of the war, I returned to a, a, a ghost town, really, um, a city uh, marked by checkpoints um, every uh, few hundred meters in some case, uh, whether they were manned by Ukrainian soldiers or members of the so-called territorial defense forces. These are volunteer fighters. Uh, the territorial defense uh, force has received tens of thousands of volunteers since the start of the war. These are people who some weeks ago were IT programmers, school teachers. One person I met had worked in a company manufacturing uh, equipment for agricultural sector, all who had taken up weapons, undergone minimal training and, and, and uh, with no time really for, for much more and, and being um, sent out, if not to the front lines, then at least to guard uh, their own neighborhoods and, and stand at checkpoints. Um, Kiev is a city under curfew. Uh, in the early days, it was difficult to find a pharmacy, to find a grocery store. And there was this feeling that any day now the Russians um, could enter. That was certainly the military uh, prognosis uh, in the early days. And it's been uh, a surprise, uh, I think, to the Russian uh, army, to Putin, and, and perhaps even to Ukrainians themselves, the degree to which the Ukrainian military, if we look at a place like Kiev, has been able to keep Russians from entering the city. There's heavy and, and tragic fighting happening in a number of suburban towns, Irpin, Bucha, um, uh, Bavari, uh, to name a few, where we've seen um, fighting that has left civilians dead, that has destroyed uh, much of the city infrastructure, people's homes. Um, but uh, as I've said, that fighting, at least on a large scale, hasn't entered Kiev itself. I, I saw evidence of a number of firefights that had, in fact, happened inside the center of the city. These were attempts by Russian forces uh, to penetrate quickly and stealthily into the capital, capital, but they were repelled by Ukrainian forces. It seems like with Russia unable to succeed in what uh, the former Ukrainian defense minister uh, called a kind of raid, this sort of special operation to quickly seize Kiev and to replace Zelensky, they've changed tactics and instead uh, switched to a tactic of, of bombardment, of, of missile strikes, of airstrikes that are, um, by definition, indiscriminate and are really laying waste to cities like uh, Kharkiv uh, in the north, uh, northeast, Mariupol in the south, and also having a real exacting a real toll on the outskirts of Kiev and increasingly Kiev itself, as we saw with the strikes in the center of the city. Uh, those strikes uh, are, of course, uh, affecting civilians first and foremost. You mentioned my time in the Ahmadut uh, Children's Hospital in Kiev. This is the premier facility in the whole country uh, for treating children. Before the war, it was the main center that accepted children from all over the country uh, with. Uh, various types of cancer, neurological uh, disorders, other very serious ailments that needed urgent care. I visited this hospital on multiple occasions in my time in Kiev. I got to know some of the doctors there. I walked the wards. I saw injured children who, uh, whose faces were scarred and bloodied, uh, the victim of shelling attacks who had, uh, had shrapnel strike them in their neck and their face. Um, their family members were also in the hospital. I saw a young, a 13-year-old boy in a hospital bed with his face bandaged, his mother also injured, lying next to them. Their other family members had died in this attack. There was a young boy named Simeon, uh, who I went to see with one of the doctors on my first trip to Ahmadud. He was riding in his family's car uh, when it came under uh, shelling attack. His parents uh, died immediately. The boy uh, was brought to the children's hospital. No one knew his identity. For several days, he was known as unknown patient number one. Uh, eventually, the doctors were able to reach his grandmother, uh, who when learned his name, Simeon. When I saw Simeon uh, with the doctors at Ahmadut, he was in a uh, coma with little brain activity, uh, his face and much of his body wrapped in bandages. When I returned to Ahmadut 
uh, Children's Hospital two days later. I saw the same doctor in the hallway. I asked about Simeon's condition, uh, and he told me that Simeon uh, had died, had succumbed to his injuries. And these are just uh, a small sampling uh, of, of the kind of suffering uh, facing civilians in Kiev and even more in other cities that I've mentioned, Kharkiv, uh, under incredible aerial bombardment, the city, the center of this historic city turned into something that resembles Stalingrad, Mariupol, where we've heard these extraordinary figures about uh, thousands of civilian casualties, perhaps one in 40 of the pre-war population of that city now dead. Um, so the suffering I saw in Kiev was really offered just a small glimpse, a kind of small portal into what is happening in dozens of cities all over Ukraine right now. I mean, your story is truly astounding. And as you tell us the story about Ukraine um, back in Moscow, I wanted to get your response to the just astounding bravery of this employee of a long time, you know, Russia state owned television station, Channel One, bursting onto the set during Monday evening's live news broadcast, holding a sign reading, No War, in Russian and in um, uh, English. Don't believe the propaganda. They're lying to you here. The protester is Channel One producer and editor, Marina Ovsianakova. Uh, um, she appeared on screen for several seconds, and I want people to listen, shouting, stop the war, no to war, before the camera cuts away. Российский премьер подчеркнул, надо усилить сотрудничество в рамках союзного государства, а на совещании в правительстве обсуждали, как сохранить доступность. So, can you talk about? We don't know where Marina is right. We don't know where Marina is right now, uh, but the significance of this, and and she said she's been a part of the propaganda machine for a long time, and also explain the concept um, uh, of what the Russian propagandists called Ruski Mir. Right. You're absolutely right that this was an extraordinarily brave act. But before I talk about what um, uh, about this moment from First Channel yesterday, I want to say that brave things or, or heroic things can be done by not non-heroic people. And, and I think the real uh, the, the real bravery in Russian journalism in recent years has been uh, done by those who continue to work for independent outlets telling the truth about what was happening. Uh, in Russia and abroad. These are friends and colleagues who work at places like Novaya Gazeta, whose editor-in-chief won the Nobel Prize um, this year, uh, TV Rain, uh, Medusa, uh, BBC Russian outlets that are now banned in Russia, forced to close with their staff scattering all over the world, facing legal uh, repercussions. So I think this act committed by a Channel One producer who admitted herself she was part of the propaganda machine for many years is an acute, isolated act of bravery, and she certainly should be commended for it. But I don't—I uh, wouldn't want to confuse or give the idea that, um, you know, this act of bravery eclipses the uh, much more uh, persistent and longstanding dedicated acts of bravery committed by Russian journalists who were never uh, part of the propaganda machine. Um, that said, uh, this action shows clearly that something is afoot inside the system, right? That there is uh, dissatisfaction, uh, even dissent bubbling to the surface, that those who are uh, part and parcel of this propaganda machine, at least some of them are beginning uh, to have their doubts. Uh, we'll see if this is the first of many such actions or if it remains an isolated case. We'll see also that uh, I think whether or not others follow in her footsteps will depend in large measure on the kind of penalty uh, faced by this uh, Channel One producer, Maria. If she is uh, thrown the full force of the law, these new very repressive laws that were passed uh, by the Russian parliament and signed by Putin in recent weeks, and she's given a sentence of say 10 or 15 years, I think that will have an extraordinary uh, chilling effect. Um, and and if, if this remains an isolated act of bravery, it, it will be one for the history books, but I don't think it'll necessarily change the actual political or informational environment uh, inside Russia. And the significance of the protests outside, these anti-war protests where, what, up to 15,000 Russians have been arrested, have you ever seen anything like this? And do you see the possibility of Putin being taken down by this? Yes, I have seen something like this in my uh, in, in the 10 years or so that I spent covering Russia beginning in 2012. This was at a time of the so-called Bolotnaya protest, named for the square in Moscow where they began, when you saw 100,000 people out in the street in Moscow to protest uh, fraudulent elections and the return of Putin 
to the Kremlin. Those protests were the largest Russia had seen in the entire post-Soviet period. And it's, I'm not really clear uh, what, if anything, they led to, unfortunately. As much as we might like to believe in people power, those protests were eventually put down. Uh, people became atomized. And it took many years to see anything similar crop up again. Uh, we saw protests, large-scale protests, last year after the uh, poisoning and then arrest of Alexei Navalny, the country's uh, most high-profile opposition leader. And in this case, unlike in the Bolotne protests, which were limited to Moscow and St. Petersburg and a few other large cities, we saw national protests all over the country happening in dozens uh, of cities. That was, again, marking an unprecedented degree of political demonstration in Russia. But again, I'm not sure that led to any real uh, political change. Uh, Navalny just now, in fact, today is again on trial. Uh, prosecutors are asking an additional 13 years of prison to be added on to his sentence. I think it's clear at this point that as long as Putin is in power, Navalny will remain in prison. That is the cold and unfortunate fact of the matter. And I'm not sure that these large protests of last year uh, had much of an effect in limiting the Kremlin's behavior or actions, perhaps only, perhaps only intensifying the belief among uh, Putin and other top officials in the need to put down even the slightest manifestation of disagreement or protest with the harshest possible methods. Now, thanks to these new suite of laws I mentioned, uh, the consequences for protesting the war have become even more serious. People can be sent to prison for three to six or more years. Um, and let's see if, if some of those 15,000 people who were arrested in protests, very brave people, to go out considering the legal risk uh, they face. But I'm afraid uh, I'm, that street protests, at least the possibility, the likelihood, the kind of street protests we're likely to see, uh, given the limitations, given the uh, legal terror that the Kremlin is able to use against them, I just don't see that being a limiting factor in the Kremlin's actions. Vladimir Putin, by launching this war in Ukraine, has raised the stakes immensely for himself. Uh, Russia is under extraordinary sanction. Uh, it's Many economists are expecting another two to three months and there could be a near total collapse of the Russian economy, perhaps def uh, a default on Russian sovereign debt. Putin has raised the stakes for himself so extraordinarily high that I don't think uh, he'll be convinced to back down based on something like street protests. In, in fact, I think he'll uh, be uh, feel the impulse or, or uh, the urge to double down, in fact, both in Ukraine and both at home, uh, having raised the stakes uh, to raise them even further before he feels like he can exit the situation. Um, and finally, uh, the increasing calls for a, a no-fly zone. And it's clear why the West doesn't want this. A direct confrontation could lead to a nuclear war. You have Zelensky about to address the U.S. Congress on Wednesday. Um, can you talk about this and the road you think needs to be taken right now? Sure. What was uh, really striking to me is how many ordinary people in Ukraine are talking about the no-fly zone. So many of my interviews, so many of my meetings across the country over these past weeks, knowing that I was American and worked for an American magazine, this was the first thing that many people wanted to talk about. And it was just really fascinating the degree to which this idea has spread among the Ukrainian people, not just people in the military, but ordinary people I met, for example, at the grocery store, wanted to talk to me about a no-fly zone. I think that's a manifestation, among other things, of Zelensky himself mentioning this so often uh, in his addresses and really creating the groundswell of momentum, both inside Ukraine and internationally, to try and push push. Um, for this measure, which, of course, would have an effect. This is not just a symbolic uh, measure, but I think a real one, given that the fact that much of the violence that Russia is perpetrating on Ukraine is coming from the air. Another question is how much is coming from delivered by fighter jets and bombers versus missile strikes. It's a, one thing to have a no-fly zone. Uh, that would not permit uh, airplanes to fly. Another is to protect against uh, missile and rocket attacks, which are a, a more difficult technical thing to, to block than bringing down aircraft. But uh, in, in talking about what an air, uh, a no fly zone would entail, I think it's important we remember 
the, the technical military details of, of what we're talking about here. A no-fly zone is not a kind of magical spell you cast over the skies of Ukraine so planes can't fly. It is the commitment to use military force to shoot down those planes. It is an act uh, of war, essentially. And I think that uh, it's therefore understandable why the Biden administration is wary, if not refusing, uh, to commit itself to essentially uh, enter the war. That is what uh, uh, installing a no-fly zone would mean, or at least that is what implementing a no-fly zone would entail. It would entail American military strikes against Russian military targets. That is effectively the United States entering uh, the war. And I think that there are uh, understandable reasons, first and foremost, as you mentioned, the desire to avoid a nuclear exchange um, uh, uh, as and to why the United States— we just have 20 States seconds, Josh. Sure. Um, so what uh, might be possible, you know, some people are talking about other sorts of technical means. Could there, could there be a technical solution to scramble or make difficult the flying of airplanes over Ukrainian airspace using cyber or technical means? That's one possibility. Another is the supply of anti-aircraft weapons uh, to Ukraine. So it would be Ukrainians using this equipment uh, to bring down Russian aircraft. I think that would still be really um, controversial for Russia, but not as nearly as much as America doing it itself. Well, Josh Affa, I want to thank you so much for being with us, contributing right writer to The New Yorker, who's been the magazine's Moscow correspondent for years and has recently just come out of Ukraine. We'll link to your piece, What the Russian Invasion Has Done to Ukraine. Josh is author of Between Two Fires, Truth, Ambition and Compromise in Putin's Russia. Next up, we look at the Biden administration refusing to directly condemn Saudi Arabia for executing 81 men this weekend in its largest mass execution ever. And what the Biden administration relationship is with Saudi Arabia. Stay with us.